जय राधा माधवा कुंज भी
Harinam Sankirtan Ki Jai. Hare Krishna Mahamantra Ki. So we're keeping up with our uh, theme of uh, Janmashtami, preparing our hearts and minds for the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And uh, yeah, I, I, I really value my teeth. That's why I hold on to this thing. <laughs> So, <laughs> and therefore, it's important that uh, we. There are many bhajans that they sing sometimes before the uh, the whole week before, just to prepare for Janmashtami. Janmashtami is the most, one of the most. Of course, Gorpornima also ranks there as one of the most important festivals for the Gaudiya Vaishnavas throughout the year. So I decided, I found this really nice description from one beautiful w book called Ananda Vrindavan Champu by Srila Kavi Karnapur. Kavi Karnapur was uh, alive when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was there but he really didn't see much of Gaur's pastimes because Mahaprabhu left before he actually grew up. But later he um, wrote in these famous for Gora Gonadeshti Pika, and that is the descriptions of the personalities in Krishna Leela who have reappeared in Gaur Leela and who they are in each Leela, like that. You know, like certain gopis again became certain of Lord Chaitanya's uh, associates. So he wrote that. That was his famous work. Ananda Vrindavan Champu is all about the pastimes of Krishna and Vrindavan. So this part of the Nanda Vrindavan Champu is called the sweetest description of Jan Mastami Leela. <laughs> And it's seven pages long, one-sided, so seven one-sided pages. Um, I was thinking of reading it. It might be a little tedious because if you break your concentration on the reading, you'll lose the whole theme. Of course, you can try to stay focused, and I'll read slow where everyone can follow. At least I'll try. Um, and uh, so this is a beautiful, it says here, um, the time for the appearance of the Lord, first we'll give our invocations, the Maum Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Pastaya Bhutale, Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine, Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gauravani Pacharine, Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Pasyatyade Sitarine, Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadat, Har, Sivasati, Gaur, Bhakta Vrinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So this translation was done by Banu Swami and Subhag Swami and was published by Mahanidhi Swami. <laughs> So the three of them combined made this available. And it says, the time for an appearance of the Lord coincided with the two internal desires of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. First, the Lord desired to descend on earth to increase the fortune of Yasoda and Nanda. Also, at that time, Krishna wanted to relish the sweet mellow of Sringara Ras, Paramur Love while enacting his worldly pastimes. For these two reasons, the Lord appeared within the material creation on earth planet, Buloka, along with his parents, friends, and other eternal associates. Another distinction of the Lord's earthly pastimes is that when the, the eternally liberated gopis, such as Srimati Radharani, Chandravali and others appeared. The Shrutis personified also appeared in the homes of the other gopis because they had previously cultivated the desire to serve Sri Krishna as Raja gopis. 
the Dandakaranya sages, upon seeing the Swakya Bhava, the sweet conjugal relationship of, of Lord, of Lord Ramachandra and Sita Devi, desire to have desire to have the same relationship with the Lord known as Madan Gopal. Upon attaining perfection in their sadhana, they achieve the good fortune of the position of appearing as gopis in Vrindavan. Yoga Maya, Lord Krishna's pastime potency, who possesses unlimited abilities, appeared invisibly in Gokul to arrange this and perform other difficult tasks on behalf of the Lord. Srinanda, Yasoda, and others appeared in Mahavan before the Lord. The gopas, gopis, and other eternal liberated associates appeared after the Lord. Then those who attained perfection of sada, namely the Shruti-chari gopis and the Muni-chari gopis, took birth in Vrindavan. Learning of Krishna's imminent appearance, the earth personified, feeling like a wife happily greeting her husband after long separation, immersed in unlimited joy. At the time of Krishna's birth, the general mass of people tasted the inner bliss that devotees forever relish. Auspicious signs abounded everywhere. As Vishnu's conch shell, Pankajanya opens in a clockwise fashion, similar auspicious sacrificial fires glowed in all directions. Pure, gentle breezes brought a refreshing coolness like devotees who sanctify and satisfy everyone with their calm, sweet, and affectionate behavior. So you're going to find in this reading there's a lot of analogies and a lot of well, what we say poetry. It's very poetic. It's very ornamentally designed. Maybe some of the words might be a little bit new to some of the devotees. But try to hear because it's really deep in bhakti and it's so sweet. You have to remember this is not just an ordinary Description, this is a deep uh, mood of bhakti that's being presented in describing the appearance of the Lord. And this is where you, this will lead to that section. Hmm. The whole atmosphere became as completely purified as the heart of a devotee. The devotees once again found peace and prosperity in worshipping the lotus feet of Lord Hari. Fruit filled the jubilant trees, but the envious demons exhibited various inauspicious signs of de degradation, such as rapidly aging bodies and the symptoms of imminent death. The desire vines of the celestial denizens seemed to be hanging in air as if to produce fruits. At that time, all the directions became... F at that time, all the directions felt as pure and joyful as the mind of a devotee who had received the mercy of Lord Hari. Just as gems, mantras, or medicines can remove a poisonous disease from the body of a person, the advent of the Lord relieved the world from the contamination of material existence and the sinful effects of the demons. Happiness gradually replaced the distressed in everyone's heart. So Krishna's coming is bringing joyfulness. It's not, he's not appeared yet, but the feeling of joyfulness is starting to arise. The bodies of all creature manifest, creatures manifested extraordinary beauty and youthful vitality. Men felt extremely joyful and displayed virtuous qualities. Throughout the world, people behaved cordially and interacted amicably. Happiness twinkled in everyone's eye. At the end of the Pura Yuga, which completely destroys faults and doubts, an auspicious, favorable, obstacle-free time appeared on the eighth day of the waning moon in the month of Bhadra. Just as that sweet moment, just at that sweet moment, the Rohini Natsa Nakshastra, along with the good qualities of the moon, and the auspicious conjunctions of stars called Ayusmin appeared in the sky to give shelter to gentle persons. 
As a living entity comes out of the womb of his mother and the moon appears on the lap of the eastern direction, Yogeshwara Sri Krishna, the personification of complete bliss, appeared amidst great festivities. As the moon appears in the lap of the eastern direction, which is like a beautiful bride, Krishna manifested the wonderful pastime of his appearance out of his love and compassion for the conditioned souls. Due to austerities performed in previous lives, Vasudeva and Devaki received the opportunity to momentarily relish parental affection for Lord Sri Krishna when he appeared before them in his form as Vasudeva. Thereafter, in fear of Kamsa, Vasudev brought Krishna to Gokul. There the Supreme Lord appeared as Govinda before Nanda and Yasoda. His eternal parents, who have been smothering him with the sweetest form of parental love since time of immemorial. The four symbols of Vishnu, Sanka, Chakra, Gadda, Padma, adorned his hands and feet. The flute, flower garland, and Mali, although present within him, had not yet manifested. So he, he's got symbols, and he's got all these paraphernalia, but they're not being displayed. In fear of cruel Kamsa, Vasudev decided to transfer all his, his wives, except Devaki, to Gokul. He sent Rohini to the house of Rajaraj Nanda. By the sweet will of the Lord, Yogamaya arranged for the seventh child of Devaki, which was Balaram, to enter the womb of Rohini. As a result, Balaram appeared in the home of Raja, Raja Raj Nanda before the birth of Krishna. Lord Hari, who is bliss personified, appeared in the home of Nanda Maharaj, the king of Vrindavan, for three reasons to engage the self-satisfied sages in devotional service, to please the devotees by performing sweet transcendental pastimes, and to relieve the earth's burden caused by the demons. At the time of his majestic birth, Krishna employed his inconceivable powers to appear in a body of eternity, bliss, and knowledge. Everyone in the maternity room swelled with joy upon seeing the Lord's exquisite transcendental form that looked like the creeper of beauty. Mother Yasoda resembled a lake of spiritual ecstasy in which a brilliant blue lotus of personified bliss had appeared. Quite poetic. Huh? <laughs> Neither the wind nor the bees relished the fragrance of that blue lotus. The unborn lotus was never touched by the waves of the modes of nature. Even Lord Brahma could not see it want to speak of ordinary men. So the darshan that Mother Yasoda is getting is not available to even persons like Lord Brahma. After Yasoda and her family members fell asleep in the maternity room, Hari cried beautifully like a newborn baby. His crying sounded like the Mahavakya Omkara announcing the auspicious arrival of his pastimes. Omkara is a transcendental vibration that had been previously emanated from the mouth of Lord Brahma. When the ladies of Vrindavan heard the sweet sound of Krishna's crying, they woke up and ran to see the Lord. With the mellow of their matches overflowing affection, they anointed his body. Can we close this AC? It's, it's really affecting my ability to speak here. <clears throat> Yeah, I am breathing that cold air and it's hard to talk. <laughs> it's not that cold out, just close it completely. Okay. Continuation. The natural fragrance of Krishna's body smelled just like musk. After the ladies bathed Krishna, with sweet ambrosia, he looked cleansed and beautiful. Then they smeared his body with fragrant sandalwood pulp. The presiding deity of the house sent a champak flower resembling the flame of a lamp into the maternity room 
to worship that ornament of the three worlds with the strength of his little arms, delicate as tender leaves of a tree, Krishna made all the lamps in the maternity room look like a garland of lotus flower buds. Pure poetry. <laughs> you following? Yeah? It's good. The ladies of Vrindavan saw baby Krishna like a blossoming flower made of the best of blue sapphires or like a newly unfurled leaf of a Tamil tree. Krishna looked like a fresh rain cloud decorated with the musk tilak of the goddess of fortune of the three worlds. The ornament of the greatest auspiciousness lined his eyes. His presence filled the maternity room with good fortune. Although a mere baby, Krishna had a head full of curly hair to hide the unique symbols on his hand, the goad, the fish, the conch shell, the Lord folded his de delicate-like fingers into his palms just to hide the symbols on his hands. At that time, Krishna laid on his back with his eyes closed. Mother Yasoda awoke amidst the joyous chattering of the elderly gopis. Leaning over the bed, she admired her gorgeous son. But upon noticing her own reflection on Krishna's body, she imagined it another woman Thinking that a witch had assumed her form to kidnap Krishna, Yusoda began became bewildered and yelled, Get out of here! You go away! Spontaneously, she cried out to Nishringadev to protect her precious son. Beholding Krishna's tender face, Yusoda showered tears of affection that looked like an offering of a pearl necklace. Yasoda saw Krishna's body as a mound of dark blue musk, softer than the butter churned from the milk ocean. Overflowing with nectar, his charming body appeared like the foam of milk, being, but being dark blue in color, it seemed the foam was full of musk juice. Admiring the supremely delicate form of her son, Yasoda worried about his safety and feared the touch of her body might hurt his tender body. As she leaned over the bed, as she leaned over the bed, Yasoda bathed Krishna with the milk dripping from her breasts. The elderly gopis instructed Yasoda how to caress the baby in her lap, and affectionately she pushed the nipple of her breast into Krishna's mouth to feed him. Due to Yasoda's intense love, personified bliss flowed from her breast as steady streams of milk. When milk sometimes spilled out of Krishna's bimba-like fruit lips onto his cheeks, Mother Yasoda would wipe his face with the edge of her cloth. After feeding her son, Yasoda gazed affectionately at him in wonder. She saw her child's body as made of dazzling blue sapphires. His mouth resembled a bimba fruit and his hands and feet looked like exquisite rubies. Krishna's nails shone like precious gems. In this way, Yasoda thought her child was completely made of jewels. Then she perceived that, he, his, he, that his naturally lettuce looks, lips looked like baduka flowers. His hands and feet resembled java flowers. His nails looked like malakli, malati flowers. Yasoda then thought, Krishna's whole body seems to be made of blue lotus flowers. He does not appear to be mine. After deliberating within herself, because Yasoda became stunned in amazement. The beautiful soft curly hairs on the right side of Krishna's chest resemble the stems of blue lotuses. Seeing the mark of Srivats on his chest, Yasoda thought it was breast milk that had spilled out of his mouth. She tried unsuccessfully to remove these milk stains with the edge of her cloth. Struck with wonder, Yasoda thought, this must be the sign of a great personality. Observing, observing the sign of Lakshmi, the golden small line on the left side of Krishna's chest, Yasoda thought, a small yellow bird had made a nest amidst the leaves of a tamil tree. 
Could this be a streak of lightning resting on rain cloud? Or could it be the golden streak marking a black golden gold testing stone? Krishna's delicate leaf-like hands and feet, glowing pink like the rising sun, look like clusters of lotus flowers floating in the Jamuna. Sometimes Yasoda saw the curly dark black dark blue locks of baby Krishna as a swarm of bumblebees surrounding his face. Intoxicated from drinking too much nectar, the bees just hovered in the sky. His thick, beautiful blue hair appeared like the dark night. The two lotus eyes of Krishna looked like a pair of blue lotus buds. His cheeks resembled two huge bubbles floating in the lake of liquefied blue sapphires. Krishna's attractive ears looked like a pair of fresh, unfurled leaves growing on a blue creeper. The tip of Krishna's dark nose appeared like the sprout of a tree, and his nostrils looked like bubbles in the Jamuna River, the daughter of the sun god. His lips resembled a pair of red java flower buds. Krishna's chin rivaled a pair of ripe jumbo fruits. Seeing the extraordinary beauty of her son fulfill, fulfill the purpose of her eyes, and she submerged in an ocean of bliss. The elderly Vajravasi ladies address Rajananda, not, and Rajarajananda. O oh, most fortunate one, you fathered a son. Previously, Nanda Maharaj had felt deeply aggrieved over his long-standing inability to obtain a son. His heart was like a small lake that had completely dried up do during a long, hot summer. But when Nanda Maharaj heard of his son's birth, he felt as if the dry lake of his heart had been blessed with a sudden downpour of nectar. The gentle sound of Krishna's voice removed all his grief and lamentation. Now he bathed in the rains of bliss, swam in the ocean of nectar, and felt embraced by the joyful stream of the celestial Ganga. Eager to see his son, Nanda's body thrilled with astonishment and waves of ecstasy as he stood outside the maternity room. Because he had accumulated heaps of pious activities, it appeared that the king of Vrindavan was now shaking hands with the personification of pious deeds. Wow. <laughs> Anxiously standing in the background, Yogamai induced Nanda Maharaj to enter the maternity room. He rushed in to see his son, the personified seed of condensed bliss. It seemed that all the auspiciousness of the three worlds now rested within Krishna, the original cause of everything. Nanda saw his son as perfectly charming person. The kajal around Krishna's eyes looked like lines of a black creeper of beauty. As the very embodiment of Nanda's good fortune, Sri Krishna bloomed like a beautiful flower in the garden of his desire. The Aparajita flower, uh, I'm sorry, the Aparajati flower is compared to the body of the Queen of Vrindavan. Her son is like the representative of the Upanishads that are compared to the fruit of the desire creepers. By seeing his glorious son, Nanda felt that he attained happiness, perfection, and the fulfillment of all his desires. Meeting that embodiment of bliss overwhelmed Nanda with immeasurable satisfaction. He stood motionless, stunned. His hair stood erect and tears flowed from his eyes. He appeared like a person carved in stone or a figure drawn in a painting. For some time, Nanda Maharaj remained in a semi-conscious state like a sleeping man about to awaken. Upananda, Sunanda, and the other relatives felt extremely joyful upon observing the best of Brahmanas perform the rites of purification for Krishna's birth. To ensure his son's welfare, Nanda Maharaj donated newborn calves to each and every Brahman, thus turning their homes into the abode of Surabi cows. 
These cows had gold and silver plated horns and hooves, and jewel necklaces adorned their necks. In addition, Rajapati Nanda filled the courtyards of their homes with hills of gold, jewels, and sesame seeds. While Nanda distributed chari, charity, the Kamandenu touchstones, the da desire trees lost their power to produce valuable gems. Even the jewel producing ocean lost their stock of jewels, and the goddess of fortune, the abode of lotuses, had but one lotus in her hand. <laughs> The auspicious news of the wonderful appearance of Krishna spread in all directions by word of mouth. The light danced in the hearts of Nanda, his brothers, Upananda and Sunanda, and all the other gopas. The gopas brought many varieties of delicious dairy products such as milk, yogurt, butter, wet cheese and hard cheese, and jewel-studded pots. The pots were tied to the ends of bamboo poles with jute straps and carried on the shoulders. Bedecked with many precious jeweled ornaments, the gopas appeared very handsome. They dressed in beautiful yellow cloth, defeating the brilliance of lightning, and held staffs topped with golden jewels in their lotus hands. As a great ocean spreads its waves in all directions, the birth of Krishna filled the Rajavasis with unbounded bliss. The gopas and gopis enjoyed a grand festival by happily eating and splashing each other's bodies with a mixture of yogurt, butter, milk, and condensed milk. The society girls visiting Nanda Maharaj's house experienced more happiness than they ever had felt since their birth. Their minds saturated with joy and satisfaction. Hearing the delightful description of Krishna's birth carried away the chariots of their minds and made them abandon all other duties. They became possessed with the desire to see Krishna. Sparkling rubies hung from the necklaces adorning the society girls. Their diamond-studded armlets shone more beautiful than drops of crystal clear water. Their jewel-inlaid golden bangles boasted unparalleled elegance. For this unique festival, they took out some highly ornamented waist belts from their jewel boxes and tied them around their hips. The sweet jingling of the waist bells resting on the broad hips enhanced the beauty of these society girls. They attracted the minds of everyone with their bulky golden amulets, loose hair braids, and graceful walk which resembled the smooth gliding of swans. Their minds entered a state of enchantment as they gazed upon the captivating beauty of Krishna's transcendental body. To worship Krishna, they brought golden trays full of auspicious articles such as fruit, flowers, yoga, derva, derga, derva grass, uncooked rice, and jeweled bedecked lamps. They covered the offering plates with splendid yellow sick silk cloth and held them in their soft hands. Their jeweled ankle bells vibrated pleasantly as they walked. Beholding the astonishing beauty of the delicate baby, the society girls considered the purpose of their eyes fulfilled. They perceived Krishna's perfect birth to be the appearance of the leaves of an important herbal medicine. Krishna resembled the blue lotus floating in the lake of his parental parents' affection. After bestowing their blessings on Krishna's prosperity, they worshipped Krishna with fresh flowers and a constant shower of loving glances. With great enthusiasm, the society girls glorified Rajeshwari Yosoda since she had attained the essence of all good fortune by having Krishna as her son. Leaving the returning to Rune, the society girls entered the assembly hall of Nanda Maharaja's palace. Their faces looked exceedingly beautiful as they sung melodious songs, which resembled the sweet, soft humming of bees moving amidst a cluster of lotus flowers. All the guests in the nectar shower produced by these all the guests bathed in the nectar showers produced by these soothing sounds. 
Overwhelmed with love, they filled then their lotus palms with more fragrant oil, turmeric paste, paste, and fresh butter, and start smearing each other's faces and bodies. They look very attractive, and then smiling faces with glittering white teeth. Then red lips seem more beautiful than red banduka flowers. This incredible display of elegance smashed the pride of the goddess of fortune of the three worlds. Carried away with joy over Krishna's birth, they fearlessly threw cheese balls, butter, and yogurt at each other. One could mistake the white balls of cheese for hailstones, solidified moonlight, or white mud from the floor of the milk ocean. Then they showered each other with buttermilk, are aromatic oils, the water mixed with turmeric. Cymbals, dambu drums, berries, and big drums vibrated auspicious sounds with specific melodies. A celestial concert of precise poetic meters, proper rhythms, and metrical compositions suddenly manifested there. The musical ensemble inspired the society girls to sing and dance in mirth and merriment. Though not good singers, but by the will of the Lord, they sang with great virtuoso. Then, then one, oops, then wonderful songs filled Nanda Maharaja's heart with joy. The combined vibration of the Brahmanas chanting Vedic mantras, the recitation of Puranic lore, and the panegyrious prayers transformed the ethers into pure spiritual sound. The sound, the joy of Krishna's birth celebrated, taxed the drains of Nanda Maharaja's city capital as they swelled to the brim of milk, yogurt, and other auspicious, auspicious liquids. Soon rivers of this nectar flooded the streets of the town and permeated the entire atmosphere with a sweet fragrance. Disguising themselves as birds, the demigods descended to Rajapur to happily drink the flood of nectar. The Rajavasis decorated their cows with gold and jeweled ornaments. Then in great incitement, excitement, they smeared them with oil, fresh butter, and turmeric paste. Beholding Krishna in their hearts, these fortunate cows looked like the essence of the earth's auspiciousness. The whole world resounded with their jubilant bellowing. Absorbed in the ecstasy of Krishna's birth, they forgot about eating and drinking. The festival drowned the gopis in an ocean of joy. After oil, offering oil, vermilion, garlands, and utensils in the charity of the assembled gopis, Rohini, the wife of Vasudev, asked them to bless Krishna. Upon completion of the sacrifice, Upananda and other relatives felt constant happiness while taking their baths. The king of Vrindavan, keeping the king of Vrindavan in front, Nanda's relatives offered him opulent cloth, jeweled ornaments, tambula, garlands, and sandalwood pulp, along with the guests. Then they humble requested all in attendance to bless the wonderful auspicious boy who had just appeared in Vrindavan. Quite poetic, quite descriptive. Did you follow? Get a copy of this? I have it on my computer, so if everybody who wants a copy, just send your email to Ananta, and then Ananta will, I'll send the, this to Ananta, Ananta can send it to all of you. Is that okay? It's really sweet. Um, I remember 1974, I was in Nurendavan. Some of you were around in your body in 1974? I think you were, right? You were there. No, anybody else? Maybe you were there in 1974? Okay, we got another. What year were you born? 70? 
70? 70. Hmm? So you were four years old, huh? <laughs> I think Mishra, he, he's got us all beat here. <laughs> 1950? Yeah. Oh. Uh, 1950. So 1974, I was in Nuvrindavan, and we had a Jan Mastami festival. And we decided to do it like the residents of Vrindavan do, as it was described in this particular pastime. So we had yogurt, we had turmeric, we had butter, and we made all kinds of nice milk combinations and we had a big fight we, and we we were throwing butter and milk and yogurt and turmeric on each other that was the last time i wore that dhoti <laughs> it became it became prashadam <laughs> but it was a wonderful it was joyful I remember it was so sweet. Everybody was, we weren't trying to, it wasn't like Kuru Shaktra style. <laughs> it was more like Vrindavan style, very sweetly throwing butter like that, smearing on each other. And then about, let's see, what year was that? Maybe the year 2009? Yeah. 2009, I was in New Vrajadam, and His Holiness Shiva Ram Maharaj wanted to do the same program for John Mostami. So he took at least, a, I think it was about a hundred devotees, and they lined up on two sides, the women on one side and the men on the other side. And that's the way it's usually done. The women throw it on the men, and the men throw it on the women, and it becomes a battle of the genders. <laughs> so that one, I didn't take part. I just watched it. <laughs> and the devotees did it so nicely, throwing yogurt and butter. But this is part of the ceremony of Krishna's appearance. So you might want to do it here. <laughs> just close the curtains first. <laughs> Make sure... It, you put plastic on the floor first. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's a wonderful festival. You can do it in farm communities. I don't think you can do it in the cities so much. <laughs> so, but the appearance of Krishna is, is a huge celebration. And the description of how Krishna looks to his mother is is extraordinarily amazing. She's seeing his body as just being made of jewels, that's all. Lotus flowers and jewels, and like that. So Krishna's appearance is so auspicious, and everyone becomes, like, happy. Everyone becomes naturally happy. It's not like you have to do something. When Krishna appears, everyone becomes happy satisfied, fulfilled, and friendly to everybody. <laughs> it's natural. So, and mentions that in the Bhagavatam too, when Krishna was about to appear, all the constellations in the, in the sky formed into auspiciousness. And then that, and by the sacrificial fires were burning so nicely, and everyone's hearts and minds felt peaceful, and there was a, a joy and a peace pervading the entire atmosphere. And this was just yoga maya preparing for Krishna's appearance in the world. So, uh, it's not like he just appears and then everybody just does, does ordinary things, no. It's like, a, it's just like grand when the Lord appears. Everything changes. <laughs> like that. So this is nice. This is from Ananda Vrindavan Champu by Srila Kaviraj, I'm sorry, Srila Kavi Kanapur. And that's a section from that book. <laughs> it's a section describing the appearance of the Lord. 
So I was asked to tell one particular pastime today. Now you're supposed to laugh at this pastime. If you don't laugh, if you don't laugh, something's wrong. <laughs> it took place in a place called Hasyavan. Hasya, H-A-S-Y-A, means laughter. And van means place, location. Place for laughter, yeah, yeah. So Krishna, he had just killed this demon, and all the cowherd boys came around. Hey, Krishna, you know, yesterday I beat you in wrestling, and you killed this big demon. I can't do that. <laughs> How do you do it? Krishna said. Krishna didn't say anything. He just stood there. And then the cowherd boys, there was a group around, they start guessing. Well, it's his mother. She gives him a special mantras. So he has this mantra for chanting. And he chants this mantra and that helps him kill demons. They're guessing now. So another boy says, no, nah, no, nah, that's not it. But you're right, it's his mother. She puts these armlets and amlets on his body and gives him all this power, and that's how he does it. No, nah, no, nah, it's not it. So they go back and forth, guessing, guessing, guessing. And then finally Krishna says, you want to know? Yeah. yeah. So Krishna says, well, when I was born, my father had a secret meeting with this great sage. And he came to see my father and he said to my father in secret, you know, this boy, he appears in different yugas at different times in different colors. And you know, he is as good as Narayan. In fact, he is Narayan. So Krishna is telling this to the cowherd boys. And, and so then Krishna says, So you want to know? I'm God. <laughs> and they're all laughing. <laughs> He's God. <laughs> He's God. <laughs> and Krishna's laughing, and they're laughing, everybody's laughing. <laughs> And it goes on, they're just laughing. That's all. That's the whole pastime. They just keep laughing. <laughs> and then they, one of the boys said, Let's go play. <laughs> you laughed. That's good. When I read the first time I read it, it's in New Raja Mahima by. Uh, Shiva Ramaraj describes all these pastimes. I was in a holy place when I read it. <laughs> I just, I laughed for about 10 minutes, <laughs> almost. <laughs> I was thinking, what's wrong with me? I can't stop. <laughs> I'm watching myself laugh, and I'm thinking, am I okay? <laughs> just kept laughing and laughing and laughing. So, yeah, so Krishna tells the residents he's God, and they all just laugh. <laughs> yeah, yesterday I beat you up, and you cried, and I stole your lunch, and you were chasing me. <laughs> so no, the point is, in Vrindavan, nobody cares whether he's God or not. <laughs> he's just so, so attractive that there's no one as attractive as he is, he attracts everyone's heart and mind immediately and always. 
And everyone loves him and can't stop thinking of him and always wants to be with him. And that's Vrindavan. And they just try to make him happy in different ways. But they didn't, when they hear if he's God, they think, yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Even if he is, it doesn't matter. <laughs> There's a, there is a place in Vrindavan where Krishna is worshipped as God. It's a small section of Vrindavan and it's related to the pastime when Nanda Maharaj was captured by Varuna and held captive. And Krishna went to save his father. And when Krishna came to see Varuna, Varuna immediately recognized Krishna as being the supreme he started offering obeisances and beautiful prayers. And, you know, Nanda Maharaj and some of the coward boys were also there, and they all saw that. And they also thought, wow, Krishna's, he's worshiping Krishna as God. And then Varuna speaks also about that. So based on that pastime, there's a section in Vrindavan where Krishna is worshiped as God. But it's just because of that pastime. <laughs> but mostly, no one cares whether he's God or not. He's just so nice. <laughs> it's like, you know, you can say, you use an example like a person is the president of the country. <laughs> and so, but when he's at home, his wife, she doesn't think of him as president. She thinks of him as, a, as my husband. <laughs> the kids think of him as father. And so the wife has very special names, she calls them, very sweet and loving names. She doesn't call him Mr. President. <laughs> and whether he's president or not is, is even not so important. The fact is he says he's my husband or he's my father. There's, the, there's where the sweetness comes in. So Vrindavan is like that. It's the sweet loving mood, and it takes away from that mood of awe and reverence, you know. So that's Vrindavan. And that's what Lord Chaitanya is teaching us, to worship Krishna and come to the level of worshiping Krishna and serving Krishna in the mood of Vrindavan. And that's the goal of the, in the Bhagavad Gita. Do you have the Bhagavad Gita here? Mm -hmm. You can bring it over. Or you can put it up on the board there. I'll just read one purport. Not the whole purport, but just part of the purport. It's in the very end of the Bhagavad Gita, 1865. Here it says here, it says, Everyone should follow the path of Arjuna, who became a dear friend of Krishna and became, and everyone should attain the same perfection as Arjuna. These words stress that one should concentrate his mind upon Krishna, the very form of the two hands carrying a flute, the bluish boy with the beautiful face and peacock feathers in his hair. There are descriptions of Krishna found in the Brahma Samhita and other literature. One should fix his mind on the original form of Godhead, and then Prabhupada goes on. One should not divert his attention to other forms of the Lord. The Lord has multi forms as Vishnu, Narayan, Rama, Varaha, etc. But a devotee should concentrate his mind on that form that was present before Arjuna. Concentration of the mind on the form of Krishna constitutes the most confidential part of knowledge. And this is disclosed to Arjuna because Arjuna is the most dear friend of Krishna. The Prabhupada said one should not have devoted as Gaudiya Vaishnavas, followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He is teaching us the path of bhakti that leads to Sri Vrindavan Dham. That's the mood. Like that. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay, so anyone would like to say anything?
<laughs> yes. Did you like the reading? Did you like the poetry? Sweet. It's so full of what they call alankaras or ornaments that when you read it, it's like you're getting hit with all these adjectives. Where is this place exactly in Vrindavan? <clears throat> I don't know. I, never, I can't. Called. I'm not sure. All I know it's mentioned. That's all I know. <laughs> but it's because of that pastime that in order to give honor to that pastime, Krishna accepts worship in the mood of the Supreme. But generally, the, the mood throughout Vrindavan. And the Vrindavan is divided into Vrindavan, Mathura, like that. And then there's a section of Vrindavan where Lord Chaitanya exists and he performs his pastimes there. So on the planet of Goloka Vrindavan, Lord Chaitanya is also there performing his leelas. And for those who are fully worshiping Lord Chaitanya, because if you're fully worshipping Lord Chaitanya, you're worshipping Krishna in Vrindavan. Because Lord Chaitanya is in that mood of serving Krishna, in the mood of Vrindavan. And that's what he's teaching us through the teachings of the Goswamis. All the Goswamis literature is based on Lord Chaitanya's teaching of Krishna Radha and Krishna Leela in Vrindavan. So that is the mood of Vrindavan. And there is a section of, but Prabhupada mentions that, of Goloka Vrindavan, where Lord Chaitanya's pastimes are being performed there. Mm -hmm. It's Nitya Leela. Mm -hmm. When it comes to this world, it is also Nitya Leela, but it's unmanifested. <clears throat> it's sometimes manifested and sometimes unmanifested. When Krishna appears, it becomes manifested. When Krishna leaves, it, it manifests itself in an unmanifested form, and for only for those who have, you know, pure devotion, in the mood of Vrindavan, can they actually experience Krishna's unmanifested pastimes on this earth, even today. So, like there's many great personalities who stay in Vrindavan and they're absorbed in Krishna's leelas, but. In the spiritual world, they go on constantly without being unmanifested. They're always manifested. This is sweet. So worshiping Lord Chaitanya means worshiping Radha Krishna. <laughs> Same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anything? Okay, we can stop here. Another question? I was wondering how does this transition takes place from this uh, more like awe and reverence type of worship to this It comes naturally through your advancement in devotional service. <clears throat> Just like in our temples, we see deities of Radha and Krishna, but we don't worship in the mood of Vrindavan, we worship in the mood of Vaikuntha. In other words, as Prabhupada says, the deities are Radha and Krishna, but they, they are worshipped as Lakshmi Narayan, which means awe and reverence. But then Krishna, Prabhupada says, but when you reach, you know, pure spiritual consciousness, and then you, Krishna reveals himself as Krishna. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of revelation that comes by way of spiritual advancement. And then there's a process. There is sadhana bhakti, and there's also sadhana 
that applies to prema bhakti. There's a type type of sadhana that you perform when you're on when you're approaching the level of prema bhakti also, which is different. And you have to read the Goswami's literature. Prabhupada also mentions it in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Mm -hmm. So it's not something you can, you know, understand until you reach there. Jai Sisi Panchatatva Ki Jai. I mean, you've, there are deities of Gaur Gadadhar. You go to Vrindavan, you'll see Gaur and Gadadhar together. Just like you see Gaur Nittai, there's also Gaur Gadadhar. And Gaur Gadadhar is Madhurya Ras, because Gadadhar is the manifestation of Srimati Radharani. So especially if you go to the Yoga Peet, in Mayapur, just near the R in Mayapur. You've seen that, right, Ananta? The Gorgadhar, yeah, Didi there. You also? Have you seen that? Yeah, so the Gorgadhar was worshipped by Bhakti Vinod Thakur because Bhakti Vinod Thakur is a Manjari. He's Kamala Manjari and he's worshipping Gorgadhar in the mood of Radha Krishna. But these are very, it's nice to, uh, to explain all this, but it comes by way of spiritual advancement. Because it's nice to know where you're going. If you don't know where you're going, you could go anywhere. <laughs> they say, you know, if you don't know where you're going, you don't know where you're going to go. <laughs> you know you're going to wind up. So we want to know where we're going. We're going. We want to go to Radha and Krishna in Vrindavan. That is our goal. So it's all mapped out how to get there. But you can't understand each of the stages until you're on that stage. You can read about the stages. You get a theoretical understanding of what it is. But until you get to that stage... You don't have the experience. Mm -hmm. Experience comes as you make progress. And with the help of Guru also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Mishra's favorite song. Shall I sing Mishra's favorite song? We gotta get out of this place. It's the last thing we ever do. Yeah. And it's not just Ljubljana or Slovenia. It's the whole material world. <laughs> we don't want to take birth again. It's very painful to take birth. But we want to go back home, back to the spiritual world. So Prabhupada said, how many lives you've been given in this world... Now just dedicate this one life to Krishna and you'll never be the loser. <laughs> okay. What did you, you're cooking something? Pizza? No. Oh, even better. <laughs> For the deities? Oh. Okay. We won't talk about it then. <laughs> so the material world offers a lot of misery just so you want to get out of it. Why is this place miserable? Because it was nice, you might want to stay here. <laughs> right? So Krishna said, here, have a little misery just to remind you, hey, you can't be comfortable here. <laughs> Don't try. <laughs> and even if you are, I come as death and take everything away. <laughs> so, you know, these, the incentives for getting out of here come in different ways. 
They come with the association of devotees. They come with the grace of the spiritual master. They come with prasadam. They come with the scriptures. But mostly, and they also come in the form of the deity, but mostly, for us, many of them, they come in the form of the sufferings that we have to undergo. Nobody wants suffering. But that's Krishna's mercy to get us, to get, to make us more serious about our devotional life. Mm -hmm. What are you reading? I have text this one. Oh, you found it? Yeah. Nyananda Vrindavan Champu. Oh, you found it on there. So, you, do I still have to send it to you? Or can yeah, I have to send it because I don't know it's some version. Okay. This was translated by Banu Swami and Subhag Swami and then made into print by Mahanidhi Swami. So I'll send it to you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada. Ki Jai.